Hey, welcome in everyone to the Sports Friday News Football Show. We are here to recap the Philadelphia Eagles season. Obviously, it was a downtrod and not a very good uh, <laughs> season for us here. But I am Joe Borick, joined by Andrew Santangelo. Uh, Andrew, how are you doing this evening other than uh, how the Eagles did just overall? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, sports are starting back up where I'm working for two games in. So it's fun to get back at it and some get back to some type of normal normalcy here. Uh, so it's doing pretty good and ready for another year. And I mean, this is our first one of the 2021. So happy new year to you and everyone else who watches the show. Um, hope hope it was a good turnover and everyone's ready to get going for this year. I'm excited and doing pretty well. Yeah, doing well here as well. Uh, the NBA started back up. There's been a lot of uh, good games. The Sixers are really kicking with gas, and the Flyers are looking good coming into the season. So other than the Eagles uh, and potentially the Phillies, um, the the thing is still out on the Phillies right now. Um, <laughs> we can make some moves in, in the offseason. Uh there's some good things going on with our teams here in Philly. If you want to include the union too, other than getting upset in the first game, they had a very uh, solid season there and look to build on that and get really annoyed in a good way and build on that next season to get past that game. Um, but we're talking about the Eagles here. And uh, the first thing we're asked is something I usually ask in my NHL videos to people of what are their first interpretations of a team so, Andrew, for the Eagles, what were your first two or three thoughts that come to mind when you think of the 2020 season that unfolded this year? Um, I think there's many words you can look at and and try to find here. So I think that's within FEC regulation. Question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but for a couple things come to mind. Uh, one, obviously, disappointment. I mean, you're disappointed from all areas. One, I, I mean, I think we'd agree. If you go back to the draft we, we saw last year pan out, I think you're disappointed in the front office with how that worked out. Uh, I think you're disappointed from how the games turned out, obviously. I think a lot of people, um, and we can discuss this later in the show, but I think a lot of people, not necessarily myself, are disappointed with the Doug Peterson and the way his he turned out this year. Obviously, Carson Wentz, I think everyone would agree, uh, had a down year, off year. Um, obviously for multiple multitude of different reasons. Um, I mean, I don't honestly, obviously there's a few players and we can get into those guys as well who surprised us. But I think for the most part, you look at a lot of these guys and, and you can use the word disappointed, uh, disappointed with the way it turned out for them. And I think they would agree with that too. Obviously a, a couple guys with the exception, um, you have Alex Singleton. I mean, I think he turned himself and I know he opened my eyes for a, maybe a linebacker in the future. I mean, obviously a year to year could, could turn out different, but I think he opened with a possible guy you might have found th that way. Um, and, and I'm not going to go through everyone, but I think Jalen Hurts opened some eyes here and there. Obviously, not the last game or two wasn't what, what way he started. He opened eyes, whether you're going to go with him or Wentz. And uh, Fogum, obviously, at times opened eyes, but, um, but but outside of those couple guys, I mean, I think for the majority of them, you're just disappointed for that. Um, I'm going to throw this word out, and I know. It's going to sound like excuses, and you can say I'm using excuses too. But I'm going to also use a little bit of the word unfortunate. Um, listen, the injuries derailed this team from day one of the season, or before the season, honestly. Um, you, you look at the stats, and you have 14 different offensive line groups out of 16, uh, 16 games, which is a record in the NFL. I mean, that's unheard of. Um, and I don't know, for those who ended up still watching Week 17, you had uh, – what's it called? You had the um, – uh, the broadcast show the stat that uh, in, in the out of the group, I can't remember everybody's name in it, um, which group it was, but out of the group who played the most snaps together, only one of those offensive linemen were supposed to start this year. So I think that says a lot. Um, obviously, you expected to have – going into the year, expecting to have your receiving core is Alshon Jeffrey, Deshaun Jackson, Jalen Rager, uh, Marquise Goodwin – or Godwin. I always mix up what it is. <laughs> um, but you had him – then you have Greg Ward, obviously. Then you have Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard. Um, those guys didn't play one game together. So um, I understand everyone's mad, and we all saw what Justin Jefferson did, but injuries derailed half that group. Uh, Alshon Jeffrey goes down. Deshaun Jackson goes down. Jalen Rager goes down. Dallas Goddard goes down. Zach Ertz goes down at times. So those receiving core you expected to have, you didn't have Miles Sanders. He didn't play a lot of games. He missed, what, the first week or two of the season. Um 
So uh, I'm not going to go through everybody because we'd be here all day. But I'm going to use the word unfortunate because I think that it did happen. Um, so I think that would be number two. And then to close out, um, I- I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to say uh, hopeful. And the reason why I'm going to say hopeful is because as bad of a season it was, I mean, Marcus, he opted out because of uh, COVID. So he'll be back next year. It's not like you're counting on a guy coming back from an injury. Um, so he'll be back. And obviously we've seen him be successful in the league. Uh, Jalen Rager is young. He wasn't a guy that got injured a lot in college. He just had a nagging injury from day one of uh, training camp, unfortunately, when he was going all out trying to make a tackle. He heard it. So that was kind of a lingering injury. Uh, I think a full year off for him will be good. Um, whether you go with Wentz or Hurts, I like I, – obviously everyone here who watches us, and obviously you, Joe, know I love Carson Wentz. Um, but it, whether they move on from him or not, I, I saw things from Hurts at times. Um, I'm not gonna, I don't think he's better than Wentz, but – with the right group again, and if you bring in guys that can succeed, uh, I think Hurts could play in this league. And then um, you'll get a full offensive line back who usually doesn't get hurt. Like, let's face it. Now with Jason Peters, assuming we're going to move on from him, Brandon Brooks is a guy that usually doesn't get hurt. Lane Johnson usually doesn't get hurt. Andre Dillard wasn't a guy known for injury, just was unfortunate. Um, and then to close out. Driscoll uh, got banged up, too. Yeah, Driscoll got banged up. Man. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to end with the the hopeful word here. Maybe I'm being optimistic or whatnot, but I don't care who's drafting. Um, that's for them to figure out. But in reality, on paper, I'm hopeful because then you're going to add the number six pick to, to this group. Whether, listen, I mean, I think we all agree we want a wide receiver, and Devontae Smith is probably the guy. But whether you add Devontae Smith or whether he's off the board early and you get another guy, Jamar Chase, who is going to be probably just as good as Devontae Smith in the league. Um, whether you add him, and even if he's off the board, if you add a guy like Mika Parsons, he's supposed to be really good as well. And you obviously need a linebacker to pair up with Singleton if you go him, or you show up another corner spot, and next year you go with Darius Slay and um, Sertan from Alabama. I don't think you can go wrong with any one of those four guys at the sixth pick, and I'm hopeful that those guys can also be a big turnaround. So uh, that, those are three words that came to mind when the season concluded uh, Sunday night. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are all very good points. I think in terms of pick, I don't think he'll fall to this spot, but if he's the best guy on the board and the lineman is there, I could see them picking Sewell if he falls to them at six, just because you'd definitely be the best talent on the board in most scouts' eyes at that point if he fell all the way down to the sixth pick. And then you're O-line, like you said, and hopeful if everyone stayed health- healthy, you could have a pretty stacked uh offensive line at that point if everyone was actually able to stay on the field while you were talking though i looked up uh i think his is goodwin because he's the double d or double O. Oh, I mean and then the win after the d so i think his is a uh, that's good win but he we have him for two more years um after this year so he's a guy that's going to come in because you're going to be losing d jack who unfortunately just can't stay healthy at this point of his career probably um, he's going to become that more veteran guy that, like you said, has experience as a deep threat. Um, and if you can match him with having Jeffrey come in and now you have someone you drafted in a Jamar Chase or Devontae Smith, if you're able to get them, as well as if Rager can stay healthy, <clears throat> hopeful would be a pretty good uh word as well because then you would be pretty hopeful for that receiving quarters Fulgham basically becomes or not Fulgham excuse me Ward basically become a slot guy at that point uh which is kind of where he should be and has shown he probably can be um in the NFL was a good on draft to pick up the Eagles ended up making last year so that's uh where I think when it comes to the offense when it comes to the defense like you said yeah there's not a lot of that is uh drenched in uh, disappointment more so than comp <laughs> compliments um slay started off looking like a bat out of hell and then before he even got banged up he kind of went into that law period of just being a good solid okay and then one game just not good corner um and then he started bouncing back and having more slay games alas so um it, he had an interesting but i think that's because of all the injuries around him he got pressed more uh, one guy, I guess, other than Singleton, that made me impressed a bit out of special teams um, is a guy that I honestly thought wasn't going to make the roster of uh, coming into the season was a uh, Marcus Epps who led our team with a whopping two interceptions. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that's he, he's another a guy. 
Yeah, he's a guy that played decent. He's nothing special. I think next year you should let him roll back into a special teams role and actually get a safety out there that is more experienced along with McLeod, unless if a Wallace is able to step up. But a uh, biggest takeaway I take from this is continuous. You kind of hinted at it a bit, but continuing to see how we Roseman fail overall at drafts. You look at other teams around the league and some teams hit on three, four people a draft. If the Eagles hit, usually it's on at most one. And then you get lucky some drafts. It's like, oh my God, two people hit. This is amazing. And then meanwhile, you have other teams that draft and they hit four to five people in certain drafts. And we're like going nuts that we hit one or two guys in a in a draft. Like that's really is what hurts you because you had the guy that showed you the most promise this year was a guy that shouldn't have even been playing. The guy that you draft out of everyone that you drafted, the guy that actually probably showed you the most promise this year is a guy that if everything went right, wouldn't have even played a snap. So what does that tell you about <laughs> Well, other than those running plays that they put him in for, what does that tell you about how well this team drafts? It's just, it, it just shows that uh, some you get unlucky with Driscoll, you can't expect them to get injured. But it's just even the games they said Dillwood was looking really bad in camp. Like you got to hope he, when healthy, is able to come in and look confident and not look kind of out of place. I honestly probably have more confidence in Driscoll than Dillard at this point because of what I heard about him in camp. I never heard a negative thing about Driscoll yet other than his injuries. So we have to see what happens with him coming back. And then J.J. Orsega-Whiteside kind of seems like a lost cause at this point, unless if you ask Chris Collinsworth after he made two catches and Chris Collinsworth all of a sudden thinks he had a good couple of weeks in a row. Um, Real quick, sorry to interrupt (laughs) because you brought up the announcers. Man, between this week and then the Cowboys game, I can't remember who did the Cowboys game. But, like, when you – I get it. We're the bottom of the barrel, so you kind of get the new announcers. But, like, man, some of those guys, like, they got to do – like, I don't know if you kept hearing them. They kept saying, oh, Doug Peterson, a run first coach. And I'm like, have you watched an Eagles game? Yeah. I, I went on Twitter. That's what everyone was just saying. Like, run first coach, run first coach. <laughs> well, what, which <laughs> game will we run first? <laughs> and it's just because, like, you know, we opened the game up, I think, with two run plays and then – all game in the second half when we kind of went passing wise, it was, Oh, he's got to go back to his run first approach. He's got to go back to being the run first coach. I'm like, he's been a pass first coach since 2016 when he got here. (laughs) Yeah. I, I don't know what that, where that came from. They got to, he has to go to being a split coach, which he just refuses to do, but he definitely has never been a run first, uh, Coach, the closest he got to that was with LeGarrette Blunt because every time we got to the yeah. goal line, he would just consistently use LeGarrette Blunt in that uh, season we yep. had him. So. And then the other thing that made me laugh was um, Miller, he goes, and we can debate this whole thing later with the Nate Sudfield thing if we want, but um, he goes, I was talking to Doug Peterson yesterday. He was telling me why, uh, or telling me that Nate, Nate Sudfield is going to get some playing time and they're going to let Hurts uh, get some rest and stuff. And then like two seconds later, he goes, I just don't understand why they're pulling Nate Sudfield. It just doesn't make sense. Or pulling Jalen Hurts and putting Nate in. It just doesn't make any sense. And, like, it just, hey, if you're Doug Peterson, you got to be questioning it. And I'm like, you literally just said two seconds before that you talked to him yesterday and he said he wanted to give him snaps and was going to give him flank time. I'm like, you just contradicted your statement. Yeah. I think the way you got to explain that is you said you were going to play him. If you want to play him, put him in where it seems smooth. The way that you did that was like the least smooth transition. It was almost like how you hear someone's fingernails scratching along a chalkboard level of a transition. Like that's how ugly that transition was where it just didn't seem like usually if you have a game that you want to look at both guys at the end of the season, it's more of like a preseason thing. It's either at the start of the final quarter at the start of the half, like you said uh, before the video, you make the move so it seems like a more subtle and smooth, like it was just going to be that way all the time. You said you were going to put him in, but because you started Hurts in the second half, people started thinking, I even saw some comments on Twitter, that, oh, maybe because he's not passing well, but he was able to get out of the pocket and run for two touchdowns, they're just going to roll with him. And then you kind of just all of a sudden – 
put Nate Sudfeld in. I think that's why it was a bigger issue than it would have been if you did it like you talked about before the video in a actual smooth way. And honestly, I think at that point, with how unsmooth that was, you would have not been hit hard if you just waited to the fourth. Because then it would have been it's the start of a quarter, the whole fourth quarter is going to Nate Sudfeld. The way you put him in, what was six minutes or whatever, it was seven something left in the third. It just seemed very un, like unhinged move. Like you just all of a sudden like grabbed a beer real quick and was like, go, 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 go. Okay, cool. Let's put Nate <laughs> Sutfeld. Like, like that, like that's really honestly, it seemed like something out of like a TV show and not like an actual NFL coach. That's uh that's just the reason why uh I didn't like it. It's not that I didn't think he was ever going to get put in because you said he was going to get put in. It's just the way in which you handle that situation. It's like uh, the bigger situation, the way in which you handled Wentz was terrible. You didn't. You you can't you can't take out your starter well, and then we find out you can't even smoothly transition when you want to give your backup reps. So no. so I mean, uh, Doug Peterson is having an issue with communication. When it comes to his quarterbacks, which is hilarious, actually, because he was a quarterback. Um, so I don't know what that. I like, no, that definitely don't make me feel. Jalen Hurts said after the game, he knew he knew he was going to bench. In his, in his post game press conference, Jalen Hurts said uh, Doug told him that he wanted to get Nate work and would enter the game at some time. Well, yeah, exactly. He said at some time, though. I'm just talking about the way in which the transition was. Like, that just seems so abnormal. Like I said, that if I was Hurts, I would still be thrown off by it. Where, like, if you came out at the start of the half, I'd be like, oh, that makes sense. Or, like, you came out at the start of the quarter, that would just made, seem more smooth. It just didn't seem like, seemed like you were, like, shoving a circular, like, cylinder into a square peg type thing. Like, it just didn't gotcha. seem, seem like it was just an ugly type of a way they did it that's all i didn't have any problem if you wanted to get a guy reps just just do it in a way that doesn't make people want to rip your head off um so that that would probably be a good way to start being one a human being let alone a head coach a good way to start is let me try not to have people want to rip my head off um so it's probably a good starting (laughs) um but (laughs) move into uh now what we what do you think um about also we have to talk about the fact that Jim Schwartz is allowing his contract uh, to expire, move on, take a year off, decide if he even wants to stay around. Um, what are you thinking the Eagles are going to do if you have any uh, thoughts of like a team's guy that you might be thinking of they could potentially look to uh, on D coordinator or if they're just stick in-house maybe and promote a linebacker's coach or promote a – Somebody of them on that nature. Yeah, first I, I want to thank uh, Jim Schwartz for everything he did here before this um, retirement or year off, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I, I know for some reason a lot of people were giving him a lot of hate, and I think it was undeserved. I mean, he helped us win a Super Bowl. Um, he was a fan. Pretty, he was a really good. Court, I mean, coordinator. He was not. He was far from the issue in my eyes. Uh, defense kept us in a lot of games. Um, I know at at the end of the day, the score might not say so, but I mean, if you think about it, with the talent he worked with, uh, time in and time out, uh, defense kept us in a lot of games and was one of the best in 2017. Um, so, I, I mean, I think I'm gonna miss him. Uh, uh, honestly, I, I think it's gonna be a tough first year. You're gonna have a whole new um, system coming in, obviously, and then you're gonna have to add pieces as well. So we'll see what happens. But in terms of possible coordinators, I mean. Here's my thing. First, before I start listing names, um, I, I think if they're truly going to stick with Doug Peterson and truly believe believe in him, I think they need to give Doug the right to pick his guys. Um, I think we've seen Howie and, and Jeffrey Lurie in the front office. I think they've, at times, overstepped their boundary, and I think they're pretty controlling when, the, um, when it comes to Doug. And uh, I think they have to give him the right to pick who he wants here. And I think that's the best way to give a coach um, an option. So I, I think that's first and foremost is um, let let Doug have some say. I mean, it, it's a major issue um, when you don't. So I, I don't know. And it, it's going to be interesting because I'm curious to see – and I guess you pretty much know everyone who's got fired at this point. Um, but what kind of jobs open up? 
uh, here in the next coming days, obviously, because um, obviously things change and new guys open up from here and there. And um, but I, I and I also I don't know are like linebackers, cornerbacks, coaches strong enough. So it's going to be interesting to see if they do go in house. I won't be able to say if I like it really or not because you don't really know. Um, I don't know if you know more than I do about the uh, in house linebacker coaches, but. I think uh, veteran, I think Wade Phillips, I think his time in the Rams might be coming up, so I think he's open. I think he's obviously a longevity guy. He's been around for a while. Um, he could be an option. Um, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I mean, and here's, here's the thing. I also wouldn't be opposed to getting a guy who hasn't been in the game, game long. Um, bring back a coordinator that – has stepped away for a little bit, and uh, and I'm I don't know if I necessarily think of him, but off the top of my head, I'm just saying like a guy like Rex Ryan. Um, again, not saying necessarily him because I feel like a lot of people would be mad at that. But I'm just saying like a guy who maybe has been an analyst for a little bit. He's kind of seen the in and out, and he's ready to kind of go back into coaching possibly. So maybe he takes the DC spot, and you're able to rejuvenate his career. A guy like Marvin Lewis, he was a defensive minded coach. Obviously, he couldn't always get it done as a head coach, but he was a pretty good. Head coach before the playoffs. I mean, I think pretty sure he still finished with above five hundred record yeah. career wise. So I think he'd be an option. Um, so I, there, there's guys out there, and then obviously, uh, honestly, you could bring back a former Eagle. Um, I, I know I've heard pretty good things what he's done in San Francisco. Uh, D'Amico Ryan's. I'm pretty sure he's a linebackers coach with the 49ers or he used to be I don't know if he was signed somewhere but maybe you take a chance on a first year guy like that who knows the city well he can help some of these not only linebackers who's a struggling point in your defense maybe learn some stuff but I mean he's always been well respected around the league so a guy like him if you want to take a chance on uh, um, let's take a chance on a guy that uh, maybe wants to be there I don't think this would ever happen because i don't think you take a head coaching or a dc spot in the nfl but an up-and-coming college coach who i think is gonna go to a bigger school he's currently at cincinnati what about a guy like luke fickle i mean maybe you say hey you might not be ready for the nfl yet as a head coach because obviously he just had a really good year with cincinnati as a first year coach maybe go here's a d spot a dc spot you stay a year or two with us rejuvenate our defense and then you get an nfl head coaching spot maybe try a guy like that and that's the other thing there's a ton of college names you could throw out there that i'm out on all the college guys but you might possibly be able to go out because i'm sure there's dcs in college as well like an alabama guy or something like that yeah. you know? so those are some guys i would i'm just to see what you think on some of those names or or if you have any other names i didn't mention uh i think all those guys are good one guy i was thinking of i know da- not dallas is um jacksonville's head coach doug marone who yep. got let go is a more defensive mind guy as well uh so you could go there um obviously the whole jet staff is pretty much gone uh and depending what you feel about his defense um even though he did have the whole bounty gate years ago, he still gets hired. So I'm assuming people think Greg Williams is good at his job. Uh, so he's on the market again. So you could go there. I don't know how people feel about that one, but uh, that's a possibility. Um, so there's a couple options. Obviously, if certain guys become available with how well the Packers defense has been playing in recent years, I'm not sure who their guys are, but maybe certain coaches below their D coordinator there could be possibilities to actually become a D coordinator because they just seem to be developing their defenders fairly well the last about three or so years uh, in Green Bay. So uh, that could be a possibility just off of the uh, top of my head as well. Um, because I think Anthony Lynn is more of a mixed head coach, like uh, kind of 50-50. But if he could be a D coordinator, then that also would be a possibility because I don't think. If he does want to be a DC, uh, go get him. I-, I love Anthony. I-, I couldn't believe the Chargers fired him. Like, I-, I think he'll probably get another NFL job or head coaching job. But if he can't for whatever reason, oh, I'm 1,000. I forgot. I already I- – I was so dumbfounded by it, I forgot they already fired him. <laughs> like, honestly, because yeah, with the, t- like with the team they just break. built and they only gave him a year, really, like, I, I was shocked by that. And um, so, honestly, if he's willing to take a coordinator spot for a year and try to bounce back uh, before he goes head coach, oh, I'm I'm all in on that. So that's a really good pool. Yeah. 
Yeah, I definitely think he's a very good uh, coordinator option if he can't get a head coaching job right away, which he probably should. But, you know, that doesn't always happen with this business. Um, So I think uh, also if the Eagles are wise, Doug will kind of swallow his pride. And I didn't really mean for that to actually sound good, but uh, and get a OC that's similar to Frank Wright, get somebody that actually comes in and really helps you if you want to have input you still have input but call the offense like Frank Wright did so you actually have more consistency because I think Doug Peterson's at his best when he does exactly what he did in our Super Bowl winning season he's more of the motivator coach he's the guy that talks to both sides when needed and doesn't just focus on one thing during the game I think that's making the players actually get more divided within him because he keeps trying to beat a dead horse when he's not the best play caller. Yeah, that's the big thing. I and mean, we know Doug's always been a guy who can keep the locker room. And I'm interested to see where that locker room is at right now, um, honestly. But um, and that's yeah, I, I agree. If he's willing to take an OC and honestly, I think that benefits almost any coach. Like, really, it's not just because of what happened this year, because if you ask me, I already said it on the top of this show, um, Doug, I, I'm a Doug Peterson guy. And if you look at it, he didn't coach this year any different than he coached the last three years. The only difference was he didn't have the same level of all the guys playing at, and the, um, he didn't have the same performance from those players. So that's the only reason why I think a lot of people were more upset with him this year. Uh, so I do think, though, and this, again, it goes for pretty much any coach. And OC is very beneficial. I, I mean, just having a guy there that maybe maybe you're so caught up in the game and you're, you want to be – do something and, and he just says, hold on, hold on now. Let's think about it real quick or whatever. And or a guy that can add that extra voice to even a guy like, I think it benefits the players too. I mean, as a coach, obviously Doug Peterson is your head coach and everything, but I mean, from maybe uh, I'll go Wentz because I won't, I mean, he had a down year or whatever. But maybe the OC sees something in, in this game that maybe Doug missed or uh, the quarter, I, don't, I forget our quarterback's coach's name. Um, but our quarterback coach misses or something like that. So uh, is it still I, Press Taylor? It might be. Um, it, I forget. I feel like he, I feel like the guy that was there two years ago left. So I just think it could go benefit beneficial in many different ways. Um, uh, so it's it's an interesting call, and we'll see what kind of offensive coordinators would be out there. Um, real quick, I hate to backtrack, but here's. Here's a sleeper option as DC, and I don't know. It might not work out because those guys never really do it because I always thought the same thing. Ricky Patalico is a pitching coach. But as frustrated as sometimes I get with Seth Joyner because sometimes I think he goes a little overboard and a little too far, that would be an interesting DC spot because he always see, seems like he knows what he's talking about. I, I'd be in, I, the yeah. him, at him or uh, – I don't know if he would ever – if he wants to, if he's interested, or if he loves WIP enough, but him or Ike Reese. Like, he's another guy. He's always talking about the defense and everything, and I, he just knows what he's talking about. He's obviously played. I'm interested to see if um, he would take a job like that. So those are two guys that haven't coached before but played here or played football and um, so that. Uh, but an OC, again, and maybe I don't know what the deal is with the quarterback's coach, um, again, who it is. It is Press Taylor. Uh and I don't know whether his contract's up or if he's going anywhere, but and I know it's his job to break down the game, and I, I know he gets a lot of fan hate sometimes here and there. But Dan Orlotsky, I mean, he knows what he's talking about a lot. I mean, I see him break down film time after time. I like listening to him on um, uh, college football Saturdays. He's been doing a lot of color commentating on games, and I kind of like the way he's going. And I don't know if he's even interested in coaching again, but again, a former quarterback, played offense before. Uh, he'd been an interesting name thrown out there as OC. And then, obviously, again, there's all those guys you go find. I mean, whether you like him or not, obviously, he wasn't a great Jets coach. But Adam Gase was a an offensive-minded coach, so he's out there now. Bill O'Brien, he's out there now. Um, so, I feel I, like O'Brien might be more of a D.C. than an O.C. But That's yeah. what I thought, too. And then I saw Alabama was looking to make him the O.C. And I was like, am I? Because that's what I thought, too. And then. It was a. I saw a report like Alabama's looking to hire Adam Gase or uh, Bill O'Brien possibly at OC or something like that. And I was like, I questioned my question. I'm like, I thought Bill O'Brien was DC. And maybe, and maybe I misread it and it was saying they're looking for Adam as the OC and Bill as the DC. Uh, so maybe I misread it. Um, I don't know if both spots are open for them or not. But I know the Alabama yeah. OC just uh, he was hired by um, 
Uh, I think Texas, maybe. As our head coach. Yeah. Gotcha. I know yeah, he signed somewhere. I, yeah, I think a sleeper OC option, the reason we uh, signed him to have is a very, uh, if all else fails, a nuclear option, security option. I think McCown is also a potential outside of the box um, offensive guy. They just loved him in the room when he came in and how well he reads a field and he is a very much student of the game. I think he could also be an outside option as an offensive coordinator potentially too, um, which might be one of the reasons why you kind of made him hang around a little bit as a practice squad guy to get him even more familiar. Um, I feel like there might've been more to play in that rather than just a nuclear option. Yeah. If all else failed um, at quarterback. So I could see that being a potential thing as well. And I could see him being pretty good at that position as well. But as we're uh, ending our last like 10 minutes here, um, we're going to go into what do you think is the biggest thing negative wise that stood out to you this season for this Eagles team? And in your mind, how will that be corrected? Oof, that's a good question. Uh, biggest negative for this season. Um, I'd say the lack of depth, I think really hurt this team. Um, I think again, I use the top of the show. Um, obviously I use the word unfortunate and all the injuries. And obviously, again, I said, it sounded like an excuse, Whereas where it's not an excuse. It's an excuse in terms of, okay, Carson Wentz and Jalen Hurts have to throw to um, practice squad guys and beyond that because those guys are hurt. The excuse there is the I think the in I think is the depth that it showed. And the one depth spot I'm honestly gonna give leeway to and I'm not gonna cry over too much, I think, is offensive line, because that was just a fluke in itself on how many guys got Injuries. hurt. Like, yeah. Like, if you think about it, like, you had Andre Dillard here to replace Janice Jason Peters, so he was going to be here. You had you drafted Jack Driscoll. You uh, you brought in, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Because of the H, Herbrig, I think. Herbrig, he was, yeah. He came in and played pretty well. My type probably pretty well when he filled in two of the higher-graded uh, guys. Um, obviously, Samalu was here. So, um, the offensive line was a fluke in the amount of injuries they had. So, I'm going to give him leeway on that. Where the problem came into play, and I think that we talked about in our pre our preseason uh, show, was spots like okay, we both love Miles Sanders, we both love Boston Scott as that third down option or whatever, but we still thought okay, and maybe Devontae Freeman was out of the price range, but bring out I'm just saying him because he's the guy I wanted in the off season. You need that bigger back to do a Legarren Blunt like you said, score in the goal line. You didn't have that depth, so even when Miles Sanders got hurt, instead of having Boston Scott jumped from a real three third down kind of back to the number one. You could have still had a Devonte Freeman who has known for being a one there in that spot. Um, and I, again, it's going to be the same GM. And I believe that he can fix it because outside the draft, I thought he's done a fine job. So I think it can be fixed, but correcting wise, obviously not in my hands. <laughs> it's in Howie Roseman's hands and Jeffrey Laurie and Doug Peterson, but same thing receiver. I mean, you look at other teams like, um, if guys go down, say, uh, I don't know, let's take out DeAndre Hopkins. The Cardinals still get to go to Christian Kirk. And I get he's older, but I mean, Larry Fitzgerald, I think anyone on this in this city would take a Larry Fitzgerald. I mean, he goes yeah. down. You're still dealing with like, Christian Kirk, Larry Fitzgerald. Um, uh, and uh, you go, you, you spin it to another team. You go to the Bills, Stefan Diggs goes down. You're still going to a Cole Beasley and a John Brown. Um, so I think same thing. You, you look here. And I think this, and this, this is what happened in my eyes. And you can say you disagree if you want. It's fine. Last year when they entered the draft, they realized how they blew the wide receiver position a few years ago. So they went desperation mode and tried to fix it all in one draft. So they drafted guys like mm -hmm. Jalen Rager, Quez Watkins, and John Hightower, hoping all of them would just come in here in the snap of a finger and be great. And obviously, you expect that in a first round pick. He got hurt a couple times, and he he did underperform a little bit. Um, but then, so when a guy like Alshon and Jalen go down and and Jackson, you were turning, instead of turning to those other potential guys, you were turning to fifth and sixth round picks from this year's draft and John Hightower and Quez Watkins and then undrafted guys like Greg Ward and Fulgham. And I'm not saying those guys can't play, but you only want to go to one of those guys. You don't want to go have them be your starting receiving court. 
um, in that sense. And then same thing on the defensive end. I, I mean, I think Darius Slay missed one or two games this year. And, and if you look who you went to, I, I mean, let's, let's just speak for itself in the Dallas game. Um, well, you, you could tell me his name because I already forget. But, I mean, obviously Slay kept Cooper in check. But then you look at the guy who filled in. What? Uh, what was it? What? Yeah, because I think Coleman missed the game, so you filled in yeah. with Chiquette, and, and he got torched like crazy. Like, you got to have a better – like, there's so many receivers slash tight ends out there. You got to know, like, I need two to three. I mean, obviously, you get that one stud corner, and then you need two or three good corners. And it got so bad, you had to move Mills, who you're already missing Rodney McLeod because of a torn ACL. You had to move Mills to one of your safeties this season, like, who you already switched positions once. You had to move him – back the corner to fill in for what happened the first three quarters. At that point, the Dallas game is too late. But um, so I'd say depth would be the, the um, I forget the way you worded the question already because I've kind of went on forever here. But I would say depth is the spot to kind of fix more than anything because, listen, we all know some of the contracts that you fulfilled last year. So some of these guys that got hurt, you're going to be forced to bring back. So you got to be ready. If a set injury does possibly happen again, you got to be ready to fill that hole. Yeah. I think depth is a big thing. I agree with uh, you on that for sure. And I do think, um, I actually said this last night to my friend on PS4, so they're definitely thinking alike on that. They tried to fill a hole in one draft. I do completely agree with you on that. They went, yeah, you know what? We need wide receivers, and we need quick people. Let's add more speed and wide receivers all in one draft. And you're like, no, that's not how that works. Um, but I think uh, they also you saw how much bigger of a loss Malcolm Jenkins really is, uh, not having him on the defense, even at the age uh, he was at, uh, losing him as a leader, especially after your uh, secondary leader and McLeod, who now became your first, uh, now goes down and isn't always around. So uh, that was a much bigger loss than we thought. But yeah, it's depth, but it's also... The big thing is, yeah, how he might do okay at times with small free agent pickups and undrafted guys he picks up. The problem is, once you pay a QB, the old adage is you have to draft well. If you don't draft well after you pay your quarterback, then you're not going to be able to fill out your roster because you just don't have, with the way the cap works in the NFL, the it's not like baseball where you can just keep continuously, if you have an owner that's rich, just pay people money. So you have to find a way to draft those good guys, bring in good undrafted guys like Ward and Fulgums to fill in as your four and fives rather than be your guys, like you said, and go from there. And the problem is how he hasn't been hitting on the draft other than he hit about three years ago, all right, and then realistically just on one guy that shouldn't have even been playing if all went well that we know of so far this year. And uh, Riker had 300 and some yards. So, I mean, when healthy, he showed some promise, not like a J Joel where he literally showed nothing. Right. Um, so I think there can be something there, but it's probably more of a guy that just fits into your scheme where if you can get a Smith or Jamar chase, they're probably more of a future feature guy where Reger's probably more of a guy that kind of falls underneath them and plays well if he can stay healthy and do well. And then you still, of course, have Jeffrey and Goodwin uh, as well, and then you would have Ward. So, if like, like you said, hopeful at the beginning is a good thing to go off of, too. But I think depth and, like you said, but also drafting is going to be key for this team to bounce back because once you pay a quarterback, if you do want to stick with Wentz, that's when teams have to start drafting better. That was a big issue with the Falcons. They haven't always been hitting and filling out their team well since they paid Matt Ryan. You saw them take a decline after they paid Ryan. The Lions took a steep decline after they paid uh, Matt Stafford. And they didn't. He's not even He's not even that bad of a contract. People think he's the most tradable on the market contract-wise of all the other guys. So that's um, why I think you have to up the ante there on the draft and really bring in better – scouting a new maybe get a new scouting system or something and kind of revamp the way it's going there i know we brought in that guy dorsey from the ravens but i think that's a big key if you want to stay successful with the way your caps it yeah i think you just brought up a good point and it's something i wanted to bring up too before we, we head out of here um the, the dorsey thing i don't know what kind of role he's gonna play 
But I think it's big in the sense of you're adding another mind in, in that uh, front office. And, and I, again, I don't know if he's going to play this kind of role, but you mentioned how we hit on the draft a, a few years ago or whatever. But if you think about it, who was there? We talk about Doug possibly needing an OC to help him. Everyone forgets Joe Douglas. He was here a few years ago. He was a big part of that Super Bowl winning team. And obviously, he was obviously well enough to get an actual GM job now with the Jets. So as much as we want Doug to get an OC, I, I think that's another big thing. If and and that's why I don't. I'm not ready to fire Howie like a lot of other people are. Because I think he has value in uh, other spots. So I think you've got able to add another guy. Maybe maybe that's Dorsey's role that they hired in season, or maybe it's a, you bring in a, a finally find another guy like Joe Douglas, but the, a guy to help him do that spot. Because I think. Listen, I know it didn't pan out well because he didn't play that that caliber. But you look at some back at some of the trades and stuff he's done. They've been good. Like the Golden Tate trade again. He didn't stay here longevity anymore, but we gave up a third rounder. I mean, that was still the right trade in the season. You needed to add a wide receiver. Darius Slay was obviously There's a good. Another move. guy we gave up that now looks like it wasn't a good yeah. decision. Now that you brought up Golden Tate here. Yeah. Um, but if you could go back and I mean, you just go on Twitter if, when that the day of that trade happening, fans were going crazy and how much how great of a trade it was. Obviously, Halley can only do so much in the spots of okay, can I win this trade? And on paper, we were all like, oh yeah, we won this trade, we won this trade, but. The guy doesn't go out there and perform. That's not the GM's uh, fault. Obviously, the draft's a different story. Like, um, you know, like you could pretty much pick who's going to be the better player there. Um, but that, that, that's my sense on that. No, that makes sense. Yeah, he's been okay in certain fields. I do think, though, my big thing going forward is if you're going to keep Wentz, then he's going to be hard as hell to trade if you are going to want to try to move him because of that contract. After a down season, that's not going to be the easiest thing to do in life either uh, with the way the cap is in the NFL. The Colts would have the best chance because Rivers, if they let Rivers go to actually have it work. Um, But, uh, yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how that all plays into place. But uh, do you have any closing thoughts that you wanted to say on our Eagles season uh, recap? We'll do another video that's like an off season report in a little bit, the next maybe month or so and get more into maybe the draft and different things from a longer outlook in that one and talk about maybe some news that's going on. But uh, this has been the sports fanatic news NFL team reaction video to our Philadelphia Eagles. It was a down season, but you know, we're hopeful that maybe we can bounce back next year. The key is we're in an absolute dog trash division. So uh, that helps. Um, to be able to bounce back and be able to get into the playoffs in the final season. So uh, that's at least a positive that is not great for history, but is li- at least good for us. Um, so we'll roll with it. But everybody, I hope you're enjoying the new year. Have a great and safe, pleasant week. For Andrew Santangelo, I'm Joe Borick. Check him out at AJ underscore Santangelo on Twitter. And me at JJBorick26. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Peace out, everybody.